you want to be really protective of your story, right? So um, I'm thinking of a story right now that I love telling or, I, you know, I've, I've written it. It's a book. I love having that book. And, and there was a lot of times I want to say, you know, this story is really personal to me. So what I want to do is I want to hold your hand as a reader down what this hospital looks like so you can be in the same place that I am when I wrote it. But I think that the biggest challenge is saying, but it's not, once that book is done, it's not, it's for you now. So you, I don't want to hold your hand too much because you're not going to be able to connect with it in that way. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network Podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today. In this episode, we hear from a storyteller I've long admired who uses all different platforms to tell her stories. She's a filmmaker, she's a writer, uh, she works in television, she's a published author, and she co-hosts two podcasts with more to come. Basically, she never sleeps. (laughs) She's also a very personal interview for me because she's family. So today, Kim Moffat shares with the Storytellers Network her storytelling craft her successes and stumbles, her secrets of storytelling, in other words, her story. Now, before we get into today's conversation, just a reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, for how to contact us, and for other resources to help you tell your story. And if you like what we're doing here, please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us to reach new storytellers. Now, let's get to the stories. All right, so joining me today is is Kim, as I mentioned in the intro. Uh, Kim is is a storyteller of all different media, but we're focusing today on podcasting. So Kim, welcome to the Storytellers Network. Thanks, Dan. (laughs) Uh, So I usually start off by saying, uh, my first question is, where are you in the world geographically? Because you can do storytelling from anywhere, but obviously you're next to me physically. For those that are seeing, you can see that. For those that are listening, Kim's literally sitting at my table right now. Yeah, so we're in Michigan. That's right. This is not where I normally am. No, so where are you normally? Normally I'm in Los Angeles. And why are you in Los Angeles? Uh, that's the only place I'm employable, <laughs> I think, probably. Uh, I work in television, so that's where the, I go where the job is. Perfect. And not only are you in television, but we're talking this season about podcasters, so clearly you're in that world. So what do you do with that? <coughs> Obviously not talk well. <laughs> no, it's tough. Uh, I'm the co-host on two podcasts that are on the air right now, and then uh, working on developing a third. So basically you get bored and you just create new, new shows. Yeah, there's no such thing as market saturation. I just do, I just go where the microphones are at this point. Now in the intro I mentioned you know, you're a part of Kim Knows Nothing and also a For Love of the Show, For Love of Show. Uh, but for the listeners who aren't familiar, why don't we talk a little bit about each of those? Give me a little brief synopsis of each one. Sure, uh, so For Love of Show is an interview style podcast. Uh, my co-host Melanie and I bring on um, different actors and actresses. We had a writer who some some we know, some we work with, some we don't know at all, and ask them ridiculous questions. Questions are not getting an interview, so I'll ask them to choose a sequel, choose out of like two what I think are great sequels, <laughs> um, or you know what's the best vacation you've been on, and how do you feel about roller coasters? So it's a way to get to know people that you may be a fan of in a different way than you would just watching an interview red carpet style. And then Kim Knows Nothing is a true crime podcast. My co-host Stacy is really into true crime, and like in a creepy way, and so <laughs> she'll uh, she'll heavily research a crime. She does all the work for it, and then I just roll into her house. I don't even do, I don't set up microphones. I don't do anything. I just stroll in and uh, she explains to me the true crime and I, I react as an audience member. So no wonder we had trouble setting this up today. Nobody knows that. Because so <laughs> you know what you're doing. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Um, uh... <laughs> so have you always considered yourself a storyteller? I... No. I don't think so. No. Probably not until you told me I was a storyteller. Did I think I was a storyteller? <laughs> like as a um, as a kid, back in like 
high school. I didn't really realize it until you were like, dummy, you're a storyteller. <laughs> and uh, then I started to kind of come around to the idea, I guess. And do you own that now? I guess, yeah. It's it's probably, I mean, it's a facet of who I am. It's not something I always <laughs> remember to tell myself, but it's definitely a facet of who I am and how I have navigated my little life. So if you think back to when you were younger, when you were in, in high school, is that where your story as a storyteller begins, or where do you think you kind of got bit by that bug, so to speak? Well, I always wanted to go to Hollywood and work in what I thought would, would be working movies at that time. So I think I did, I guess, want to be a part of a storytelling process at that point. I wanted to be an actor, so I wanted to tell stories that way. But yeah, it really probably wasn't until high school and um, you were out in California and we were writing together. You were separately, but you know, at the mm -hmm. same time. And I think going through that process helped me realize, you know, I am a storyteller and these, this is how I want to be telling stories. And then that kind of set me off on my journey. So you tell stories in podcasting, obviously, mm -hmm. um, or you listen to stories and tell them and this kind of thing. But going into Hollywood, going into TV, into film, short film, different media now, I mean, YouTube is its whole medium, I think. Yeah. How do you tell stories differently in each one? And, and can you? And, and not only different mediums, different media, but different like positions. Not all storytellers are writers in Hollywood. They're directors, maybe, or other things. Like, how do you... How do you see that whole world as a storytelling world? I, I think it's all... <laughs> I, something that popped in my head while you were talking was um, when people get upset that the movie is not as good as the book, <laughs> my reaction is always, it's a different audience. It's a different story completely. It just happens to be vaguely similar. So I think um, it, it really is just what kind of story are you trying to tell? So even if you, you wrote a book and then it becomes a movie, what... What is the story now that's a movie? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Now that we're kind of pulling it a little bit more out of the reader's head and putting it in front of someone's faces, how do you tell your story through wardrobe? How do you tell your story through um, set decoration? What does the house look like? What, is, you know, what does a doorbell look like in this world? How are you telling that story? So it can get very deep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I used to be a tour guide at Warner Brothers, not to... <laughs> um, and something that we would talk about a lot is you'd walk through these back lot areas and you know you you walk down a what's supposed to be a really busy New York street but no one's filming there so there's nothing on these streets there's no door handles there's no pipes there's no um, cabinet knobs there's nothing and what I would tell people is yeah because that doorknob tells a story are you rich or are you poor is a doorknob in you know 1820 it looks a whole lot different than a doorknob in like 2250 so you know is it going to be a keypad doorknob do you have money to do a keypad doorknob is it a good area is it a bad area and you have like five different locks on your door so now when you're you know depending on the medium that you're using to tell your story you can tell it in different ways and sometimes you're writing a book and you're kind of forcing the reader to, reader to do their own homework which is cool i love i love that reading side of it where you can think of your own look or whatever that's that's a yeah that's good yeah. what what do you love about storytelling in particular um i love that it forces me to think about different worlds in different ways and you know what to go down different avenues and explore a different lifestyle through a different character and what would life be like if i was telling a story that took place here in michigan versus you know a story that took place in los angeles and being able to explore different avenues and stuff do, do you also, like, how do you feel about exploring those different ways to tell a story over different media? I think it's fun. I think it's really fun. Now I'm doing 17,000 podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a cool way to tell a story. And it's, I think that it brings on a new challenge, too, because what's the best way to tell your story? And how are you serving your story best? Because there's some stories that not every book needs to be a movie. Not every TV show needs to have a book series. Every podcast host needs to have a million podcasts. <laughs> but it's, it forces you to really sit down and say, what is my story? What's the heart of my story? And what's the best way that I can give my story to the world? What do you personally find is a major challenge in storytelling? Not holding the reader's hand. Mm. Just 
giving you want to be really protective of your story right so um i'm thinking of a story right now that i love telling or i you know i've I've written it it's a book i love having that book and and there was a lot of times i want to say you know this story is really personal to me so what i want to do is i want to hold your hand as a reader down what this hospital looks like so you can be in the same place that i am when i wrote it but i think that the biggest challenge is saying but it's not once that book is done it's not it's for you now. So you, I don't want to hold your hand too much because you're not going to be able to connect with it in that way. And does that hold true across, again, I like to go back to different media. Yeah. Because we're, there's just so much, too many different ways to tell a story now. Yeah. Do you find that same challenge, whether it's when you write, you don't want to hold your hand, or when you write a script, or as you're creating that set dressing? Yeah, kind of. And you want to, and, and it's also telling a story visually through, you know, a short film or a movie or anything like that feature. You have to allow other people to tell the story in their way also. Mm-hmm. So um, this short film that I, I did a little while ago, I didn't decorate. I, didn't, I wasn't the set decorator for it. I wasn't the set designer. I didn't do hair and makeup. I approved costumes, but I didn't come up with this is what they should wear this time. This is what sh- they should wear this time. It was just kind of what hair and makeup decided that that story would look like for them. Um, This is what wardrobe decided that the movie would look like through wardrobe. This is what set decoration, set design would look like through that. And um, I don't know, I think it's really cool to watch other people have such a large piece of telling the story as well. And obviously the actors. So when you talk about other people, do you enjoy that collaboration too? Is storytelling not, not always only you? Do you enjoy working with other people like that? If they listen, well. <laughs> if they're huh? great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. I think it's really fun. It's, it's cool to see that happen and, and to see that collaboration and, and a story that you're trying to tell to see them feel a connection to it. And then they, they're excited about it, so they want to help you. And it's I love that. And that's I think that's why I love working in, in television, too, is everybody feels as connected to that story, regardless of what their job is. So as a storyteller, now we're not we're not concentrating a lot on podcasting here because I, I find you as a storyteller, all the different avenues you take fascinating. So maybe we can get back to the podcasting eventually, but I want to talk about this. <laughs> um, do you have an inspiration as a storyteller, like a muse maybe or something? Or I don't know. I have like writers that I look up to. Um, my cousin, you don't know, a uh, different cousin of mine. <laughs> but you, you don't know. Um, I, I like, I, I have other writers that I'm really big fans of or other storytellers I'm a really big fan of. And then more, I think, than a muse, I have, I'm more goal-oriented. Okay. So instead of the process of sitting down because the story has, like, reached into my little heart and burrowed its way in and now we need to get it out, I that's a, a very real process for a lot of people that I'm not good enough for. <laughs> I'm just not that good of a storyteller to have that. Instead, it's just like, a, I, I want to achieve this goal. I want to have this career landmark. And so doing those things, it's a you know storytelling process, I guess. Do you find that same kind of goal setting crosses between when you wrote your book and when you write a pilot and when you write a short and when you prepare for a podcast? I think so. I don't do a very good job preparing for podcasts. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. Um, does it show? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> They're conversational. I They're suppose. conversational. So there's a lot of, oh, I didn't know that about you. <laughs> Person I've been friends with for years. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I think so. I think it, it helps in, in preparation. And it maybe makes me, me myself, a better storyteller because I'm, I'm you know, trying to achieve a goal and so it makes me kind of dig in a little bit further and makes me find my work ethic or it might it might not I don't know what can I say I've heard uh, the the cliche in marketing is blogging is like jogging you have to just keep doing it no matter how much you hate it that day or whatever and, and the results will come from that mm-hmm. do you find that storytelling and writing in particular uh, is kind of the same thing I've, cause I've heard that from other writers too it's like I have to write every day do you yeah. find yourself needing to exercise that muscle constantly? I think, yeah, if I sit down and write, it becomes easier and, and less of a chore and, and it feels better. And my writing is better, too. If I'm sitting down and writing every day and I'm sitting down and reading every day, 
in my it shows in my work. It's better work for it. Um, uh, do I do it still though? That's a different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just kind of depends on how focused I am, and also, you know, what's going on with work and everything too. So you mentioned work, right? Storytelling, writing is who you are at your core, but work is sometimes not that. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what else do you do? Uh, I work on the show Fuller House for Netflix. I work in their production office. So you're a part of the storytelling team from a different side of it. Yeah. So again, that collaboration is huge, huh? Completely. Because the writers write the story, obviously, and then the cast and everybody. We're, we're in more of a, um, we're the production office. So we're where the scripts come through to get distroed and we're where equipment comes to get or ordered and where all the departments kind of meet up to to make their own department work. But it's a, still a, a key of that storytelling. I don't feel any more or less connected to the show because I'm not, you know, in the writer's room putting pen to paper every day. Which I, I like that idea that the, the listeners hopefully kind of take away from this is that, and I hadn't thought of this beforehand, but as we're talking about this, I think of this. Storytelling, being a storyteller, being part of a storyteller world doesn't have to be pen to paper. Right, yeah. it, it, collaboration is so important, and when you're talking about big projects, and even books, you have editors, you have people who help market it, you have all these different, mm -hmm. you know, a, a cover design. You can be a storyteller in all different ways. I think that's really cool. Yeah, it's fun, and it's cool too because you know we'll see, I'll see a script outline come in, and then I'll follow it all the way through to show night. And I, I love that process of watching and like falling in love with a joke, and then. <laughs> Finding out the joke uh, has broken up with you, has ghosted you. <laughs> in the middle of the night, <laughs> between the blue script and the pink script, suddenly it's gone. Or, um, like, you know, you, you're watching these characters develop, and especially because I've been working on the show since the pilot. So watching these, you know, little characters and little jokes become, like, a whole big world for the show is really, really fun. I love it, yeah. That's very cool. If you think about one of your favorite stories... Mm -hmm. uh, what is a word that you would describe your favorite or the most impactful or just a great story? What's what's something you would use to describe that? Legacy. Legacy? Yeah. Um, immediately I just thought of this book called The Office of Loneliness. And it's a collection of short stories that was written by a young woman in college. I think she gave a speech or she wrote a paper or something at her graduation, she may have been one of the speakers at graduation, she passed away in an accident that night or the next day. Wow. And then um, her friends and family and teachers, I think, all got together and found different pieces of her writing. So finished. She was an English major. She was. She would have gone on to have an exceptional career. And uh, they put it all together, and, and this was. they were able to let her stories get out. And it's one of my favorite books. The writing is beautiful. It's really, really good. And it's also like that's a legacy for her. That's that's gonna live on forever. Yeah. Hmm. We'll have to put a link to that in the show notes because that sounds I, amazing. Yeah, I highly recommend it. And I bought it because I was interested in the story behind the book, and um, and I liked the cover. <laughs> so you judge books by their covers. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to know. Judge is, <laughs> I'm not a good person. I do. Is that terrible? No. I, don't. Okay. I mean, I mean, no, no, it's not because you, you want to be drawn in, right? So yeah. again, it's that storyteller of the cover art. Yeah. Right? And you know what it is? I think it's because, yeah, I, I mean, I know that it's terrible. It's a terrible cliche, but it's also, <laughs> I know what kind of story I want to read. And if the cover is helping, helping tell me, hey, this is... That story that you're looking for, we're going to help you kind of lead your way to it. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Why do you think we as people love stories so much? Because I think it's kind of all we have. It's this, like, not intangible thing that is so incredibly important to us. It's the one thing that we've always done throughout time as humans. As our technology evolves, we still revert to telling stories. And we still sit down and it's a way for us to connect not only with each other. I can look at you and tell you a story. It probably won't be very interesting to Might you. Might have to do with crows or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, I can look at you and tell a story and we can connect. But then I can also tell a story online. I can tell a story through a podcast. I can tell a story through um, Twitter. And it can connect with somebody all around the world. 
And I think that's really cool, and it helps keep these human connections. So when you mention all around the world, it makes me think of this this idea, too, that social media in particular mm -hmm. has affected storytelling. How do you think social media has? I think it's made it easier to reach an audience, maybe more of a niche audience. You can find your people, and you can find your stories there online. I think social media has changed a lot in the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that the way I use social media is completely different now, just in this last year and a half. But prior to that, it was a lot of like, this is just a joke that I've kind of had sitting in the notes section of my phone. And <laughs> I'm going to try it and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I don't really care. And if it does work, that's great. Makes me feel good. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, it also has a really impactful and important purpose as well. And you can tell the way that I use social media to tell stories has changed. So uh, now I'm telling real stories and helping other people elevate their voices and telling their own real stories versus like, why do fish stay in school? Why are fish not have jobs? They're always in school. <laughs> you almost messed up. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so we, so uh, you t real people telling real stories and you helping people tell real stories and making mm -hmm. a difference. Um, you not only tell stories in podcasts and, and on and with TV and all those other things, you actually are a documentarian. You're a documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. and, and you've worked on one for a while, and you're actually making a movement out of it. Yeah. I, I know all that, but I want the listeners okay, to know. Okay, great. Well, so <laughs> <laughs> but I want, to know, I want the listeners to know. what. Tell me a little bit about your documentary, what it was about, what it is about, and what's what movement it's fueling. Sure. So this... I want to start at the top by saying that a key part about this story is um, is a pretty political issue, but it is not a political movie. So don't be, I hope that nobody listening is turned off from it. Hmm. But uh, a couple years ago, 2013, there was a state senator in Texas that was doing a filibuster for women's rights, women's health rights. And I found it through Twitter. No news stations were covering it at all. She went on to have a 13-hour filibuster. And then she ended up, um, from that and getting the national attention, ended up running for governor. So I was really drawn to her story and was uh, really moved by what she had done. So I decided that I would go to Texas and film her campaign and film her run for governor. And then that turned into uh, making a whole movie about voter apathy in America and trying to approach it from a different way. So instead of trying to understand, hey, why aren't you voting? I don't know that that necessarily works um, and, and not to disparage any company that's trying to do that. There's a lot of really great companies that are doing a lot of really, really good work or organizations that are doing really good work to try and turn out voter apathy. But it's a lot of it is kind of like trying to talk to a wall. So this documentary is trying to understand what gets people excited about voting and what got me so excited about um, Wendy's story, who was a woman that ran for governor, and then uh, just about voting in general and trying to take that excitement and harness it to get other people who are not excited to vote to vote. And then this now has turned into a non, what will soon be a nonprofit organization called We're the People. We're the People at Work. And uh, it'll be in the show notes. <laughs> we'll put a link up on the website. <laughs> um, and um, to, to try and encourage people to say, hey, I don't, know, I don't know what gets you excited to vote. I don't know you and your friends, but you do. So if you have three friends that you love and you care about and you all have the same interests and goals, but they don't vote, I want you to grab your three friends and get them to the polls. And I'm going to help you. I'll help make sure that they know how to register to vote. We're going to help you find the polling booth. I'll talk to them. I'll get on the phone with them if that's what it takes. But you know your friends and trying to encourage you to find your own personal responsibility and their own personal responsibility and just get out there and like do it that's awesome yeah we, and, and you've worked on other documentaries too a music documentary and you mm -hmm. like i just I, I love all the different venues that you take to tell stories so job well done when you have one of those documentaries or when you have your your you know your podcast for love of show how do you get that story out and how are other storytellers supposed to get their story out nowadays with you know, the noisy landscape mm -hmm. and everything else going on and not much money maybe how do you how are we supposed to get those stories out today i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you have over 500 people on instagram what are you doing? uh i don't know you know i'll be completely honest i am lucky enough to work on a show that i love 
with cast that I, I love and um, some of them follow me on social media and some I, sometimes I'll post about my job and so I've gotten followers that way. I don't think they care about me. <laughs> like they're just excited about, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I truly don't know. I think it's about knowing what your market is and then being excited to, to talk about it, to say, look, to, to look for what you want to talk about on social media or to, you know, be looking for hashtags, looking for whatever, and being excited enough to you do the work to get in there and say, hey, I'm... Being like at a party. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just overheard you talking about voting. I wanted to let you know that I'm doing a voting documentary. I would love for you to be able to check it out. Here it is. And then go, you know, try to make that connection. Networking and being a part of the conversation, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. And 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 I get from you, knowing you personally, seeing you online and everything else, you're not afraid to try new stuff. That's true. So do you think that's something, I mean... Oh, I'm a marketing guy, so I tell people always be testing. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you cognitively do, or do you just intuitively? I'll try almost anything. Uh, I think I just don't have a, a smart filter. <laughs> <laughs> I just I'm willing to jump in and say I'm not. I I don't know. Maybe it's just in the last couple of years I've decided that like my personal brand is not one of like genius <laughs> so I'm not embarrassed to just say like I'll, I'll look I'm not afraid to look silly because I know that it happens often enough that it doesn't bother me to, to feel I'm not embarrassed to just kind of jump in somewhere and introduce myself and maybe that comes from job you know previous jobs that I've had and working with the public and you know so I hear you say don't take yourself too seriously yeah, yeah, I think that's a, a much better way of putting it than like, <laughs> oh, I'm not very smart, and I just say stuff. <laughs> no, yeah, don't take yourself too seriously. And I think it also comes from, if it's something that you really, really care about, what are you willing to do, and what part of your shyness or your whatever is holding you back are you willing to give up in service of what you care about? That was well said. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Word, wording good. Um, I wrote it on my hand. Okay, cross that <laughs> off. <laughs> Uh, so you're on IMDb. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're on a, you're on a TV show. You're successful, uh, even though you're un- unemployed at the moment. I mean, um, I mean, what it is. Uh, it makes you, me laugh that you said successful. <laughs> I think so. Um, do you look around at any point and kind of pinch yourself and think, again, not that you've made it to the point where you can sit back in your laurels and do nothing, but mm-hmm. do you look around and go, man, I, I'm I'm doing this thing? Yeah, literally every single day when I, um, you know. <laughs> TV shows are seasonal, so <laughs> I, I've been on hiatus and just working on other stuff um, while in between seasons. But when I'm at work, there is not one single day that goes by that I'm just, like, knocked out by the dumb luck that got me there. Which is sort of what it feels like, um, which may or may not be true, but it's still, that's, you know, every day, I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> and on those hiatus times, you're again, you're doing other projects. You have two podcasts, more to come. Whether you're as a host or as a producer or whatever it is, you you do this documentary thing, you do shorts, short films, mm-hmm. like you are always doing something. I just uh, have a web series in post right now. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So yeah, l- l- looking around at yourself, thinking uh, I'm doing this thing, that's incredible. How you mentioned dumb luck, but <laughs> I want to ask this question, but I'm going to feed you your answer. Oh great! <laughs> <laughs> when you and I talked the other night. So for, so for those listening, Kim and I are, are family. Uh, we're also just very close. We're, we're cousins, like second, I don't know what the, what the hell it is. But I don't know either. Some kind of cousin. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've lived together when we were younger. We've written together. We've, we've become very close. So we're like almost like siblings. Uh, or maybe like siblings. Maybe almost. Sometimes not. Anyway, I love you. It <laughs> depends. <laughs> Why is it always a question mark? Um, it's a lot of inside jokes. Apologize. But, but Kim and I know each other very well. So we, we talked the other night, and I like what you said about it's not that hard to be successful. Just do your job. Yeah. So how did you get here to this point where you are well connected, doing doing this work that you love? How did you get to that point? Besides dumb luck. <laughs> it's honestly just kind of having faith that you're always exactly where you're supposed to be, even when you don't want to remember that. <laughs> because there have been times where I have cried because the job I wanted wasn't mine to have anymore, or. You know, the show that I was on got canceled and now, but it, I always, like, I can trace back to, you know, I got a job at Warner Brothers 
because I happened to be in the tour department for some reason. I was with my mom. I think we were just getting Starbucks, and the manager was there. So I asked him if they were hiring because I really needed a job. <laughs> and uh, I worked at tours. When I was at tours, I met somebody who had an aunt who worked on a show. She, she hired me, said, uh, why don't you come work on this pilot with me? I quit my job on tours. My last day was Monday. It was a holiday. Tuesday, I started that show. Friday, that show was canceled. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> yeah, you want to ask my mom about it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who was more stressed out. She, I really thought that I was going to have to leave L.A. This woman ended up working on the show Southland for TNT. That was her other job. She let me work on that job. From Southland, I got a job on Heart of Dixie. From Heart of Dixie, I got a job on Community. From Community, I got a pilot. It's just all these things. And it was always, I was never, I was not going to get, I got this job because I worked with somebody on Southland. And he knew that they were hiring. There's no way to pull one dot and not have gotten exactly. So the, just the blind faith in, this is where I'm supposed to be. I don't love it. Well, right now I do. But you know, there's times where you're, I don't love it. I don't want to be here. But you're there for a reason, and you kind of just, you know, trying to figure out what that reason is. And it's not just sitting back. It's trying to figure it out for yourself. I'm here because I need to learn this lesson. I'm here because I need to get to this point. Or I'm here because I need to leave, you know. And, and I, I like what you said about being, being present, mm -hmm. doing your job. Yeah. And, and, and it sounds like reputation goes a long way. It doesn't in Hollywood, in L.A., mm -hmm. but I think it does anywhere. As a storyteller, when you want to make those connections, your reputation has to be something that you're that you're concerned about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not that hard. Like we were saying the other night, it's not that hard to have a good reputation. <laughs> it's not that hard to do good and to do well. You just need to do it. Yeah. Nike said it best, I guess. Anyway, uh, <laughs> when it comes to the platform, to different, different kinds of, of media, do you have a favorite way to tell a story? No, I don't think so. I think it just, like I was saying earlier, it just depends on what the story is. Yeah. What is it that drew you to the podcast world? Um, I was sitting around talking, but I think around the same time, my co-host on For Love of Show and I, we share an office. And so we <laughs> used to do this thing called Coffee Talk, where we would catch up <laughs> and uh, talk about our weekends or talk, you know. And then uh, if somebody, our office just happened to be at a place where when the doors open, anybody can walk by. So mm -hmm. we just look at him and be like, Boyd, come on in for this episode. <laughs> and uh, then we would talk to him and ask him questions. And then around the same time, Stacy was, uh, my co-host on Kim Knows Nothing, was telling me about a true crime. And I was like, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> um, and I'm scared, so go faster. <laughs> go skip over the scary parts. Mm -hmm. And I think we just kind of both pretty organically in two separate ways thought mm, this might be kind of fun i may know the answer at least i think i know the answer to this but i want to hear what yours is okay who give me th i'm going to say three because i know you can't just do one give me three of your favorite storytellers and why like different different maybe different different platforms whatever it is but, mm -hmm. but give me three of your favorite storytellers oh man okay I can name at least one, I think, but go ahead. Let me hear what you think. Maybe uh, I'll cheat and take your answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? Uh, <laughs> Tina Fey. Yeah, yeah. Tina and Amy Poehler. Yeah. Um, they uh, both make me too nervous to want to... <laughs> but the way that they tell stories is really... It, they take a what can be a really common situation, a really unique situation, and they make it... Both, I don't know how to explain it. This sounds. This is gonna sound so dumb, but they 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 make it both completely relatable and completely ridiculous at the same time, and that's a, a line that I don't know how they do it. And I've seen Amy Poehler do improv in person, and watching her do live improv is like watching the best athlete that you can think of in their prime. It's amazing. It's Quick. There's a speed to it that is frustrating because <laughs> I don't understand how it works. It's like a magic trick. Yeah. So you you can play the fifth, but uh, since you mentioned Amy Poehler, you you work in Hollywood. You are surrounded by famous people all the time, uh, and not just like waiting tables. Uh, so I gotta believe that when you meet somebody like this, you're just like, hey, how's it going, right? Yep. Okay, cool, cool. <laughs> I did. Listen. 
everybody's just a person. <laughs> uh, I did, sometimes when you meet a hearer, your body does weird, does weird things. <laughs> I did cry when I met Amy Poehler. I said, uh, I, I, she was coming out of this improv show and the way that this venue works, there's just no escaping. <laughs> you and I are both using the same valet stand, friend, whether you like it or not. And uh, so I was, when my friend and I got to the show, we were talking to two people, and I turned around, like mid, I was probably talking, and just was like, no. done with you. Never. <laughs> I was like, I'm done with you, because I turned around, and there was Amy Poehler, and I was like, yep. So I turned around and walked over to her, which I would never do now. Never. But I had to. <laughs> and I was watching from above going, don't do this. This is a bad idea. It will not end well. And uh, I said, can I talk to you for a minute? Like she owed me money. And she was like, of course. Let me put my ticket to the valet stand and see how quickly they can get me out of this situation. And uh, then, bless her heart, she came back. And she talked to me and I said, you know, I'm, I'm a writer and you, and I think that's the only time I've ever <laughs> described myself that way. <laughs> First off, I was like, I'm a writer and you and Tina Fey are my heroes. And then I think I just was like, you know what is good for a stranger to see is tears. <laughs> As I just started crying. It was weird. Sometimes your body gets confused. <laughs> it was great. She was a good sport. <laughs> it was really, really nice. I I, I tell that not not to give you too much grief. I tell that because I, I feel like, like again, like and, and we and we talked about this before too. You, our family looks at you as like this great big Hollywood legend sometimes, right? I mean, the younger family, the kids, the do. kids do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you work at Fuller House, you know, like right. Oh. But I, but I think I mean a lot of us realize that like you you are around you are in that world you are of that world now, and so for you to be of that world but still have those heroes, I think is a beautiful story. Like, Thanks. like truly, I think. I mean, it kind of gave me a little bit of a, a choked up moment there. Of like, I can see that. It was so, exciting. Yeah. It's it's cool, no matter what world you're in and who your heroes are, to have a chance to say to them to their face, "You are my hero," and uh, whether it goes good or bad, <laughs> is good. Um, my grandma, other one, is another person that I would say mm -hmm. because. I can remember being little and her telling me stories, like five stories, and then just wanting to hear these stories on loop. And even after she passed away, I just wanted to like grasp onto those stories. And nobody can tell them as well as her. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you I, know, <laughs> I, I will bow to Aunt Lillian. No problem. <laughs> you know, nobody can. And she just, and maybe they weren't even great stories. They were just, you know, something that she, I enjoyed hearing and she enjoyed telling. And I, I like that. Do you have anything from her? Like, did she write anything down? Do you have anything from her at all from that kind of thing? I have a book, you know, one of those Grandma Tell Me About Your Life books. Okay. Um, it hasn't been edited, so who knows if it's true or not, but <laughs> <laughs> I have her stories, and that's what I've got. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's very cool. All right, so you told a great story, and you're talking about great storytellers, but I want to know if you had the, the opportunity to tell only one more story, and you can't tell stories anymore, you can't consider yourself a storyteller anymore, what would that story be or be about or what would that look like for you i don't know you don't want me to tell any more stories no i want you to <laughs> but if you know wendy said look i've written a law that you can't no i no, what would, you know if, if that was if it was your last whether it was your last day on earth whether it was okay i can't do this anymore because it was outlawed we would still do it i know that we were both of that mindset yeah <laughs> but I just like the idea of if I can only tell one more, what would that what would that be? Whatever that means to you. Yeah, I don't. I really don't know. Um, I don't know what that last story would be. I I have stories right now that I'm I'm working on, but they're not like I wouldn't want them to be my last story for sure because they're not <laughs> good enough for them for me to be like this is the last one. Um, I don't know. Honestly, it would probably be, I would want to tell my grandma's story or, um, oh, my mom's going to be so mad because her story is great too, but my mom's best friend, <laughs> um, uh, it, pretty incredible story there also. Yeah. And what's her name? Carmen. <laughs> I, love, I love Carmen. I miss, I miss Carmen. Carmen and your grandma both. You, you are surrounded by some amazing women. Yeah. Past and present. Your, your mom is amazing as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't just say that because she probably won't listen to this because she's just too busy. <laughs> she's the busiest retired person I know. <laughs> exactly. Um, cool. Well, that's that's what I have for you, Kim. Where can people learn more about you? Whether it's the documentary, 
uh, what you're doing with the show, the podcast. What's the best way to get in touch with you? The best way is I'm on the internet.com <laughs> if you've ever heard of the internet um, all of my stuff together everything kind of has its own website but the hub for it all is 0323 like March 23rd 0323 productions with an S dot com um, or Twitter and Instagram at Kim Moffitt and we'll have all that in the show notes so okay. thanks for taking the time to come all the way to Michigan from California to talk well just talk for, with me just for this just yeah. for this that's how big of a deal the Storytellers Network is I know it you came from Fuller House, you rapped, and came all the way here. Yeah. So everybody, if you're thinking about do the sh- doing the show, do it. Book your flight. Book your flight now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for being a storyteller. I appreciate it. Thanks for helping me be a storyteller, Dan. So thank you so much to our guest, Kim Moffat. I really do appreciate her sitting down with me and telling the story, even though... I know her very well. She's uh, basically a sister to me. Uh, I learned things today that I, I didn't realize. And then she brings a great depth to the storytelling. So thank you, Kim. I do appreciate that. Uh, you can, of course, find the links to contact Kim uh, in the show notes at 0323productions.com and more is in our show notes. So check those out. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it all over the place. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, text it, email it. And until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.